All right, welcome golfers to another episode of Learn with Linksman. Steve Reed here with the Linksman. I have a very special guest on the show, but before I get into Corey, I wanted to just talk about what we're doing with Learn with Linksman. We've done a few podcasts here on YouTube. Uh, most of these are focused on how I've become a better golfer off the golf course, not just necessarily focusing on my swing. We've done yoga for golfers. We've done holistic uh, healing for golfers. We've had my club champion, club fitter on the show. And today I have a very, very special guest, Corey Devell. He is a hypnosis therapist, and I'll let you actually kind of introduce it if you don't mind. Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, my why name don't you is. Tell us about yourself. Thank you. Uh, my name is Corey Devell. Uh, I have a company called Orange County Hypnosis Center, which is located in Irvine, California, and uh, it's uh, all about really essentially letting go of people's resistance to whatever issues they may be wanting to uh, achieve in their lives. Um, I found that over a period of time that people have what we call resistances, but they're usually predicated on something that has to do with emotion, uh, could be physical, could be cellular, could even be a, a belief system. I, I usually refer to that as a spiritual trauma. It doesn't mean anything religious for those of you who might be out there taking offense to that. It just means that we have a belief system that might be in opposition to something that we want to achieve uh, on, a, on a conscious level. And I'm sure most people know this on some level, that they, they may be trying to accomplish something, as, as you were when we were talking about this just earlier, about breaking a certain level of, um, uh, of achievement, you know, getting under 80, for mm -hmm. instance, or, or tennis players who you know, played other people uh, that they can't beat. They have this one guy that right. they just can't, no matter what they do, they just can't beat this guy. But they beat other guys who beat that guy. Right. You know, and they like take them out. But that one guy, they just can't seem to overcome that. And it, it involves letting go of whatever there is in, on a subconscious level that's keeping them from a, achieving that goal. So how, how long have you been doing it for now, would you say? Oh, longer than you've been alive. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I actually started doing hypnosis when I was in high school. Okay. And I used to be that guy at the parties that would like, you know, hypnotize people and tell them that, you know, when they wake up, the number four is going to be missing from the numerical system. Yeah. And then I'd purposely say, how many fingers do you have? And they'd say, well, 10, you know. And I'd say, why don't you count them? They go one, two, three, five, six, seven, eight, no nine, way. ten. No way. The four was completely falling off. Yeah, they just couldn't see the four. It <laughs> so it was your party trick in high school. Yeah, it yeah. was like it was a good way to meet girls. Yeah, and, of course. You know, all of that stuff. But it was funny because one of the things that really made it a very serious thing for me was I was working a little bit later on. I was working with a guy who was very suggestible, and uh, he was. It was. I, I think this guy told him that he didn't have a butt. I said, you know, you can't find your butt, but, you know, when, you're, when you wake up, uh, you know, because he was standing, I said, you know, when you wake up, you'll want to sit down, but you can't find your butt, you know, and I, everybody just thought that was hilarious, and it was funny because he went over to a chair, and he just kept looking at the chair, and, you know, looking around, I said, go ahead, you can, you can sit down, you know, and he said, I, I can't, <laughs> and everybody's, like, looking at him, and he, I said, why not, and he said, I I don't know where my butt is. Oh, that's hilarious. Yeah, it was really, really, I mean, at a party situation, it, it almost looks contrived. Yeah. But really, for the, for the short term, and usually that's what um, stage hypnotists do, yeah. it's short term, very, very, like within 24 hours, the suggestion is basically gone. Yeah, you're reverting right back to the Yeah, habit. you'll go back to yeah. common sense, rationale, all of that stuff. But what I found out with this guy was that he was so suggestible and he was terrified of dentists. He had to get some serious work done on his teeth. And the only reason that the, the, the dental problem had escalated to the point that it was at this point where it was really painful for him is because he hadn't been to a dentist in probably 15 years, something like that. So anyway, I, I hypnotized him and I really went all out with him. I just said, you know, tomorrow when you go to the dentist, you're gonna feel really relaxed. You're gonna feel so relaxed and of course, I was saying this to him when he was under suggestion. But you know, I said, by the time you get to the dentist's office, your face is going to feel like it's already numb. You're going to feel very relaxed in that atmosphere. Uh, the smell of alcohol, which was one of the, the things that terrified him. Yeah. I said, it's going to be friendly for you. You're going to feel really comfortable. As a result, while he was sitting in the waiting room, before he actually went in, 
his face got numb. And it was so numb that by the time he was sitting in the dentist's chair, he told them, I think you can do the work without anesthetic. Whoa. And uh, so, you know, they don't normally do that. Of course not. But they were checking and, you know, they just kind of poked around and they said, do you feel that? And he said, I don't feel anything. Oh, my so gosh. So they actually did the work on him. Without With any no anesthetic. numbing medication. No numbing medication. Wow. The other part of it that was was shocking uh, because I went to the same dentist, by the way. You know, uh, I knew the uh, assistant, and I was asking her about it, and she said it was the most amazing thing she ever saw because not only did he n not feel anything, but at one point in time, there was a lot of blood. You know, because yeah. they were doing a lot of work around the gums, and they asked him. She just said. If you can control the pain, can you control the blood flow? And he actually did. He controlled Whoa. the blood flow. And they were able to do the work quicker without having to, you know, continuously, you know, drain his mouth. And then when they sewed him up, she said that was the moment of truth because his gums were basically blue. Yeah. And uh, she said, can you, like, let the blood flow now? You know, is that okay? And he just said, yeah, yeah. And he just allowed it, and it turned pink, and all of a sudden, a little trickle of blood came out between the stitches. Unbelievable. And didn't, didn't have anybody like that before or since, but yeah. it was, that was like the major trigger in my journey toward helping other people get over some major obstacles in their life. It made me realize how powerful the subconscious mind can be. So and, during that session, you were tapping into the subconscious with this. Absolutely. In that, okay. So maybe you can kind of talk about that. Let's di like double click on the subconscious okay. uh, for the viewers because a lot of people don't know what that is. Yeah. So what, why are you tapping into the subconscious? What is it doing? And how are you really helping these patients in your hour-long sessions that I've personally mm -hmm. been on as well? Yeah, yeah. The, the whole idea is well, a basic understanding of, of who we are is that we have this prefrontal lobe that's all about our interaction with the rest of the world. Uh, what we can see, touch, taste, hear, and smell. That's, that's the, the rational part of our, our brain. We have another part that we refer to as a subconscious mind. And that's the part of us that actually remembers and knows literally everything that has ever happened to you in your entire life experience. And arguably, even in, it depends on the person out there, don't want to offend anybody, but I've done past life regressions with people that remember things that are not of this particular life experience. It right. can extend that far. So uh, that subconscious mind remembers every second of every minute of every hour of your entire life experience. The reason why we don't on a conscious level remember that it's too much information. Right. Our conscious mind is processing somewhere around 400 to maybe 600,000 bits of information per second. But the subconscious mind is in the trillions yeah. per second. So it's not only listening to whoever's listening to this, pro uh, this program right now. It's more than just what they're receiving in terms of what they're listening to or, or seeing. The subconscious mind is calculating the temperature, the barometric pressure. It's, it's uh, digesting food right now. It's, it has this amazing intelligence that is, it's a genius, basically, mm -hmm. that we don't normally use. We, we get information, bits and pieces of information as we need it. For instance, right now, a, a bit of information that may be roaming around in your subconscious mind that you're not having to use on a conscious level is, I would say, oh, uh, what's your address? Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, it, it comes up. Right. But if you don't need it, where does it go? You know, you're not needing it right now. Where does it go? Where does all this information go? It's all held in a nice, safe place in the subconscious mind, and you'll receive the information as needed. In other words, it's like a program. Mm -hmm. If we know how to ask for something from the subconscious mind, we can retrieve it. Now, the problem that most people have regarding all of this is that there, there, there are emotions that may come up in a person's life experience that may have to do with something negative, let's say. Um, and that negative emotion, let's say, is kind of keeping them from doing something they want to do. I've had people come to me that want to have a breakthrough with a certain amount of money. Mm -hmm. You know, they just hit this level and they'll, they'll be within $10 of, of, of a breakthrough, yeah. but they can't seem to get past that one little area in their consciousness. 
what we can do with a, a process I developed over many years. I call it biofeedback. And of course, all of you have probably heard biofeedback a million times. My version of it is that I talk to the subconscious mind that literally, biologically, knows where all of the information is. All we have to do is access it. Right. So what I do is I get the person in uh, what we call the theta stage. And they're actually wide awake, as you know. Yeah. Wide awake as we're doing the process, but their, their subconscious mind is literally answering questions with yeses or noes. That's right. why I say it's like a computer program. Binary programming is all about ones and zeros. It's yeses and noes. That's how the, the computer programs work. That's also how our minds work. If we can phrase, let's say, a statement so that the subconscious mind can tell us if that's a yes or a no, then we can solicit answers from the subconscious mind without having to go through a whole litany of explanation. Right. So I developed this process where I can literally make a statement to the individual who's uh, experiencing the biofeedback and the subconscious mind will tell us whether it's a true statement or false. Yep. So part of the process is just finding out, does this person have, let's say, an emotional trauma or a physical trauma or cellular trauma or a spiritual trauma that's literally keeping them from doing whatever it is they want to do. And once I find out what that is, then I have to find out some particulars. Yeah. One of them might be, do we need to know when it happened or was there an incident that happened that triggered this negative emotion? If we do, we find out. If we don't, we just move on. It's like, again, it's like a program, you know, if, if this, then this, yeah. that kind of uh, thinking. Yeah, and I've obviously had some sessions with you. I know my wife Jamie's had, and you are the main reason she was able to start her startup company, Philip mm. Buttercup, and you're one of the main reasons why the Linksman is born. So thank you awesome. for thank all you. of your help, and it's <laughs> the exact reason you're on the show. So uh, thank you for that. And, you know, kind of tying this back to golf, as we usually do on this show, mm. I, you know, I tried passing that PGA test, you know, um, six months ago or whatever, mm -hmm. and, and I practiced, I prepped, I did everything you can possibly imagine for this thing. I show up, shoot one of my worst scores ever, fail it, and then for the next five rounds, I couldn't break 80. And mm -hmm. normally I'm like a 75 to 78 shooter. And so I come into you and, you know, we do the whole process, biofeedback, everything. And ultimately, I think really was I just started taking it too serious and I wasn't having fun. And mm -hmm. I remember you specifically saying like, you know what, next time you hit a bad shot, I want you to smile, laugh, and essentially trick your subconscious to that bad shot being a fun, good shot. Mm -hmm. And I did it. I did everything you said. And sure enough, that next round, I shot like a 76 and it was like I was back. <laughs> right. And yeah. that all of those bad five rounds are, are in the past. Mm -hmm. And it really helped. That session was great. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I guess tying this back to golfers, um, with this subconscious practice that you do, um, what are some things that maybe a golfer who's having a bad round or who's not performing their best, what, what would you recommend from all of the therapy and the training you've done with this biofeedback? You know, is it something we can do on ourselves, or is it something you need to be in front yeah. of someone? Yeah, I, it, it can be. I think that the fundamental part of it is to find out where the resistance is. Uh, many times it's not something that you can just quickly access. But um, a big part of what's going on in people's minds has to do a lot with what you were talking about. You know, what are they doing in that moment of struggle? You know, am I, you know, I, you know, whatever it is, you know, I hit a bad shot, whatever that happens to be, or if you're a tennis player or whatever it happens to be, you just hit something, you know, uh, incorrectly, let's say. Generally speaking, we wind up having all of this judgment mm -hmm. about, you know, oh, I'm just terrible. Why am I doing this? I mean, I, you know, it, all of a sudden we let all of that snowball into this, this self-loathing that goes on. Right. And that's, I would say, is probably the most fundamental part of getting a person to a place where they, they allow themselves to, to, you know, these are sports. These are things right. that we're, we're supposed to be right. having an enjoyment to right. do. It's a leisure activity. Yeah, right. And, right. and we take it so seriously. And yeah. I get it. There's a lot of big money involved in all of this stuff. Yeah. You know, and, and it, it could be... And uh, ego. <laughs> and a lot of ego Mostly involved ego. in it. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I do like to you know, uh, focus on it from that standpoint because part of the ego, when, when people talk about ego, it, it is like a, a very self-serving. It seems as if you know, it's all about uh, a prideful nature. Yeah. That... 
that same thing that they're talking about that can be uh, very snobbish, let's say, about, you know, well, I pride myself in this or that. It can also be, and most of the time is, the other side of that coin is that it is filled with self-loathing. Yeah. When you slip up, even something very small, whatever it happens to be, that ego part of you is there to make you feel even worse than you could ever feel on your own, let's say. The ego jumps in and is willing to kick you when you're down. Right. And it's, it's like, okay, then what is going on with this ego? If it, does it have that part to it uh, that is all about feeling superior to people? And does it have this other part to it, this very dark part that makes you feel like you're not worthy? Right. They're both related. It's like two sides of the same coin. Right. So it's not about becoming over-elated with anything. It's about getting to a place where you have the balance that's really necessary in all of this. And that's what I was trying to introduce to you as a part of this process. And yeah. it can happen with anybody out there. It's simple things. We change one little thing and everything else will follow. You can, uh, you know, with some people, I'll, I'll, I'll tell them, you know, what do you do in the morning when you first get out of bed? You know, what, for, what, uh, what foot touches the floor? Yeah. And they'll say, oh, it's always my left foot. And I say, tomorrow morning when you get out of bed, let your right foot touch the floor. And just watch what happens from there. Hmm. Just do one little thing differently than you normally do. And if you allow yourself to do that, what happens is it's in the back of your mind somewhere. All of a sudden you're going, oh, yeah, I've been doing that for 10 years or right. whatever it or is. Or since I know. was five. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And I put my, my right foot on the floor today, and can I let that be the start of something different? Interesting. From that point forward during the day, there'll be other things that you'll do. That they will, will follow. Yeah. You know, I had one woman called me up, and it was actually quite funny. She was having a whole lot of problems with her divorce. There was all kinds of negative things going on in her life. And um, she had been very, very, you know, in a kind of almost apathetic state for a long time. So when I started working with her, of course, we found out where all of the traumas were and yeah. we let them go. And she said to me the same thing. She said, well, what can I do on a day-to-day -day basis? And I said, I just want you to do that one thing. Let, instead of your left foot, let your right foot touch the floor. Sure. And you do that. And I said, and then if you get the urge to do something else that's different, follow through on that. Just, just try maybe a different way to go to work. Yeah. Try a different you know, avenue or something like that. And she called me up. It was so funny. She was like laughing hysterically. And I said, what's going on? What's, what's happening? And she said, well, I took your advice. I, I did you know, the right foot instead of the left foot. And she said, and then I decided that I was going to brush my teeth with my left hand instead of my right hand. I was just going to bring that up. Yeah. And she said, I almost poked my eye out. <laughs> She said, and I had her mouth completely. toothpaste in yeah. my nose yeah. and around my face. And she said, when I yeah. looked at myself in the mirror, I couldn't take myself seriously. And she said, I just started laughing. Oh, and she said, great. from that point forward, everything in my life started to change. It, it's the simple things. Yeah. We don't think about those very much because we're so used to doing them all the oh, time. Of course, we're so routine humans. Mm -hmm. It's crazy. Yeah. I did the same thing. I used a Sonicare toothbrush and I had pain in my shoulder and I was using my left hand. It looked, it looked like someone had never brushed their teeth in their entire <laughs> life. You know, it like leaves your mouth, toothpaste yeah. goes flying, yeah. you, like to your point, you hit your nose, you're like, what is going on? Yeah. This should not be that difficult. This machine yeah. does it for me and yet I'm still struggling. Yeah. But then after a couple of days, you, you realize like you almost forget how to use your right hand and this becomes the dominant hand now. Right. And right. it's just those little things to change it mm -hmm. up. So then I guess back to golf, would you recommend, um, I don't know, someone swinging left-handed just to change it up or is that a little extreme? Cause yeah. I mean, that's hard for me to do. I try swinging left hand. It looks like I've never golfed before in my life, mm -hmm. but what, what would be something a golfer struggling with and maybe just change, change up a routine or two? Yeah, I, you know, it, it depends on how they do their setup. Everybody, if, if you notice how you do your setup, mm -hmm. uh, that's where it starts. You know, are, are you using your right hand, even for like, you know, put it, pushing the tee in the ground? Yeah, true. Which hand do you use to do that? Right, right. Yeah, yeah. my Could, dominant hand for everything. Yeah. Everything. Could you let your left hand do it? Yeah. 
And I've tried, yeah, I guess to your point, I've tried that. I never even thought of that. And it's like weird to put it in. I put it on an angle and I look back, I'm like, wait, why is the tee almost falling off? Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. But little things like even to that. Yeah. yeah. Or how you pick up the ball. Do you always pick up with your right hand yeah. out of the hole? Maybe yeah. try it with your left hand. Even yeah. the, the way you pull your, your clubs out of the bag yeah. or whatever it happens to be, you're, you know, those, uh, those itty bitty little things will make all the difference in the world. Sure. It's just a matter of changing one tiny little nuance. Everything else will follow. All of a sudden, you've, you've changed the program. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, maybe a, a good illustration of this would be, you know, in programs, and I'm sure everybody out there has at one time or another had to put their phone number into a program on, you know, online or yeah. whatever it happens yeah, to be. Yeah, buying something online, yeah. Yeah. And, and what happens is the program there that they've got designated says, okay, this is where the area code goes. Mm -hmm. Now, if they put an L in there, yeah. it's going to stop you Invalid. right there. Yeah. Yeah. Invalid, yeah, also character. It, yeah, you, you've screwed up here. You've got to go back. You can't go forward, you know, that right. kind of thing. That's what's happening with the program. When we change the program consciously, we literally do that. Hmm. We're, we're changing the way that we're approaching something. Now, it's important to have something positive behind that change. For instance, if you're saying, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get ready to tee up here, I'm going to use my left hand, and I'm just going to take the time to do this. What is behind that? I'm allowing myself to do this differently mm -hmm. so that I can get a better higher or lower whatever it is you know of course in golf you want to get a lower number yeah but the idea is i'm doing this to kind of affirm in my own consciousness that i have the ability to change i don't have to continue to do things the same way yeah by doing this little thing i'm reaffirming in my consciousness that i can actually change the way i approach life in general you'd be amazed at how i, I had somebody have this happen to him some time ago and this it's not directly related to golf, but just as an example of what we're talking about. Somebody came to me, had a relationship issue. This happens in my business a lot. Uh, and we let go of the trauma that she was experiencing. When she was driving home from my office, she was actually you know, looking forward to having a cigarette and thinking about what, you know, what we had talked about. She said she went to reach for a pack of cigarettes, and she said, oh, uh, I'll, I'll wait until I get home. Hmm. And she got home. And she didn't feel the urge to smoke a cigarette. And then later on, about two or three hours later, she called me up and she said, I don't remember you saying anything about quitting smoking. Yeah, it wasn't, that wasn't the yeah, session, that right? Was, that yeah, was, yeah, yeah, we were trying to help her with her relationship. Right. And she said, so what happened? You know, what, what's going on? I said, well, when did you start smoking? In that relationship? Yep. No way. The first argument she had with this person she that she was with. She found cigarettes. She went and got us pack cigarettes. No that was way. an adjustment that she made. And when we resolved the issue with the relationship, the need for the cigarettes was gone. Wow. That's how that far gives me reaching. Chills. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. crazy. That's how far reaching it is. So that's why I say even the small things, you change one little thing, you don't know how far reaching that one thing can be. Right. But if you do a positive affirmation, you're almost guaranteeing that you're going to have a positive uh, outcome. For right. That. So yeah, change those little nuances, tiny little things that may or may not even be related yeah. to golf. It might be the way you, you know, like you said, you know, you just try to do something different yeah. while you're brushing your teeth. Right. But yeah, if you're out there on the golf course, there's a whole lot of things that you're doing that are just the way you've been doing yeah, them. Routines. Routines. Yeah. Golf is all about pre-shot routines, sticking to the same routines. But to your point, there's other routines that can be changed that are very minimal that have yeah. big effects. Exactly. And yeah. they, they would seem like, oh, just this one little thing, that's not going to hurt anything. Right. Uh, but if you have a positive motive behind that change, again, I can't stress that enough. I'm doing this so that I can get a better score. And right. then you, you do it and you take it lightly enough so that even if it goes in the ground, let's say crooked, like you were saying, yeah. you know, oh, I didn't quite line it up the way I do with my right hand. Take the time to do it. While you're doing that, be smiling about it. Enjoy that process. Let's see if it works. Right. It's that kind of an attitude. Well, let's just see. Yeah. You know, what could it hurt? Ex nothing. I mean, of course. Exactly. Yeah, you know, course. so give that a shot with a positive affirmation behind it, that's already creating a new and different program. 
that's changing all the way down the line. The yeah. dominoes start falling all over the place, and the next thing you know is, wow, that was great. I just played a great round. Yeah. Did, what could that have to do with my left hand lining up you know, the, yeah. the tee in the ground? Right. Doesn't matter. Do you have Stick to know everything Stick about all it. of that? You know, a, a big part I find with people too is, is they talk themselves out of their own good. Yeah. You know, they'll say, oh, it enemies. couldn't be that. It yeah. couldn't be that. You know, and then, then they almost work against it. Now I'm going to line it up just to see if I hit a bad shot. Yeah. What's the affirmation? Yeah. You know, th again, it's, this is how subtle the, the subtleties are with our, uh, with our conscious and subconscious mind. Yeah. If we decide that we're going to move in that direction, have some positive motive behind it, enjoy the process, allow yourself to do some little thing differently and your outcomes are going to be amazing. Yeah. And you brought up positive affirmations. And I think that's something we should double click on because, mm -hmm. um, we're our own worst enemies in life without a doubt. relationships, family, mm -hmm. but golf is mm -hmm. probably, I mean, I grew up playing all, all the sports you can possibly imagine, did them all. Mm -hmm. Golf is easily the, the number one sport where we can just kill ourselves on the course. <laughs> I mean, you, you just mentally, emotionally, physically. Yeah. I mean, I've seen people hit themselves with clubs for missing a putt. I mean, you name, I've seen it all. So back to positive affirmations. Mm. What do you recommend someone who's having a bad round instead of blowing all 18 holes? Let's say we start out hole one, double bogey, hit the ball out of bounds, could barely make a putt, right? You're just like, oh my gosh, I have 17 holes left, <laughs> right? And you're just miserable. You're, maybe yeah. you're at uh, Pebble Beach or got, you know some really popular course mm -hmm. and you don't want to ruin that entire round. Like what's something simple that someone could do on the golf course, positive affirmation wise, mm -hmm. to not fall apart for the, all, the, the remaining 17 holes? Yeah. See, there's, it, that's a tricky business with people because there's this consciousness of, the let's say the next thing that they're going to do being very contrived mm -hmm. uh, like oh well okay I'm going to smile and pretend that I didn't just you know double bogey or yeah. you, know, uh, you know shank a ball or whatever it is I'm going to try to 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 do this but what's behind it see what's behind it is I don't really I don't really feel good and I'm really angry about this whole thing and right. I'm pretending that I'm doing well I like to say, is it possible for me to play differently? Is mm -hmm. it possible for me to do something else different from this, this point forward? Could I allow myself to do something a little differently? Now, when I say that, it's, it can be as simple as any number of other things, but one of the things that I often use in my office when a person has, let's say, a negative emotion, where they're angry about something, uh -huh. emotions come and go. They're just like everything else in life. Mm -hmm. They are not attached to us any more than this little bottle of water is attached to me. Right. So, you know, if, I, if I'm holding on to this and it's actually hurting my hand in some way or another, I don't think twice about going, oh, geez, you know, it's, it's hot or a right. cup, cup of hot water or something like that. I can put it down. Emotions are the same way. Negative emotions are things that come and go in our life experience. So when we see that correctly, my, my statement to, would be to them, is it possible for me to let this negative emotion go? And it, it is helpful, actually, if you have maybe a golf ball in your hand or you mm -hmm. have a tee in your hand. This is the way I'm holding this up, and I'm saying, okay, to myself, is it possible for me to let this go? Well, the reality is, of course it's possible. I'm holding it with my hand. I mm -hmm. could let it go. Second question, could I let it go is the first one. Would I let it go? Now, that one involves a little bit deeper stuff. Why am I holding on to it? Do, is there some purpose for me being uh, angry at myself or having this self-loathing that wants to judge me because I made one bad shot? This is that part I was talking about before. Yep. You see how the ego jumps in. Oh, I made a wonderful shot and it gets very prideful about that, right? But if I make a bad one, what does it do? It kicks you when you're down. Crumbles you. Yeah, just beating you up all the rest of the day. Yeah. And, you know, and you're saying, yeah, it was that one thing I did that you know, blew my whole day. Right. I like to go in this direction. Could I let that negative feeling go? Right. Whatever that negative feeling is, whether it's anger or it's frustration or whatever it happens to be, just like this. 
home audience, could I let this go? Second, would I let it go? Would I let it go? Why do I ask that? Because we have our reasons for holding on, and a lot of it has to do with self-judgment. Would I let it go if I knew that by letting it go, I could play a better game of golf? Is it worth it to me to let this silly feeling go so that I can get on with my life and have some fun today? Now, it sounds silly, but if you ask yourself those questions, could I, of course, would I? Now we really get into the deeper part yeah. of our, our reason for holding on. And then the would I part of it does wind up being, okay, if this meant that I get to have more fun today, it is worth it for me to let it go. Now the question is, when? Now. I like Let's that. Let's drop it now. Not tomorrow. Now, believe it or not, I do have people come into my office, and I'll, I'll do that with a Kleenex or something, and, you know, they have this fear emotion or something like that. And I say, you know, could you let it go? Yeah. And I say, would you let it go? Yeah. And I say, when? They go, next week. Really? Yeah. <laughs> Why next week? Not today. <laughs> I don't that's, feel comfortable letting no, it go funny. today. It's, it's, it gets funny. Yeah. It really gets actually quite funny because people are, they're so familiar with those negative emotions or issues that are going on with them that they're almost like a, like a bad friend. Yeah. You know, like, you know, somebody that you hang out with that you don't really want to be hanging out with, but, you know, it's company or something like that. You know, so I'm just hanging out with this person, but I don't really care for him. That's how negative emotions are. Right. And they become familiar, and we use them as a part of our process throughout the course of our lives. We don't even realize how negative they can be. Yeah, that's so They're true. just familiar. Yeah. We can let them go. Right. That's interesting. And so a lot of that was with positive affirmations. Mm -hmm. And so is there, you know, I guess, you know, I'm on the course, I'm like with my buddies, am I realistically going to, you know, hold the ball and do like those steps? Maybe not, maybe. Mm -hmm. Is there something else just mentally that we could do um, to avoid a bad round um, while we're walking to the next shot even? I mean, yeah. or is it this exercise that you're doing? Absolutely. It, it gets so simple that, you know, it, and it sounds so fundamental and, and, uh, and almost obtuse, but it isn't. It's like taking the time to separate yourself from that negative emotion. It doesn't necessarily have to be something physical that right. we do. But it, it, it goes back to, well, why am I actually here? Yeah. Like, what is the point of me being here yeah. right now? And, 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 and on whose behalf am I being so upset? Because we have these, you know, we have an angel on one shoulder oh, and a course. devil on the other, you know, have that yeah. whole thing going on. And, you know, on whose behalf am I being upset? Now, the, the angelic part of you is saying, hey, it's a beautiful day. Right, enjoy the weather, the what are nature. You doing? Right. Yeah, you should just, you know, so what? You hit a bad shot, you'll make up for yeah. it. What are, you, what are you doing? This, this is supposed to be fun. And the other side's going, oh, you, you don't suck. You, yeah. you should go home right now. Yeah. What are you don't, even doing out here? Don't, you don't, you don't belong bore your Beach. friends with right. how bad you're going to play today. That's how rude the ego can be. Yeah. So, yeah, the idea behind it is, okay, could I let go and not listen to that dark side that's right. you know, just yelling and screaming and making all of this noise? We have our choices here. We actually do have a choice about how we're approaching all of this. And it's, I, I know that I've had some people that actually look forward to hitting a bad shot. Really? Yeah, because it's, it's something they want to learn from. Oh, you know, interesting. Like, can I actually do that? Uh, could I experience that and just see what it feels like? And it's interesting that, that the more they actually, and I'm not recommending it to everybody, but the, it's, it's like the more they look for that problematic area, the less they find it. Yeah. It's like they don't have an overt avoidance to it, which is a big part of why we screw up. We're like trying so hard not to that we wind up invariably making a bad putt or you know, doing something that we could do 50 times. And then you know, the one time we allow ourselves to move into the direction of, oh, well, not today, you know, that kind of thing, or you know, something else happened, whatever it happens to be. We let that enter into the picture, and the next thing you know is we you know, pull off a bad shot, yeah. you know, or whatever it happens to be. But if we're almost on some level, I'm not saying you have to look forward to playing bad golf. What I'm saying is if you do have something like that happen to you, 
let the part of you that actually does have control over all of this move in. Could I let that go? Is it possible? Just asking. Yeah. Is it possible for me to let this thing go? Mm -hmm. We all know, of course, it's possible. The, the rationale behind it is very simplistic, but it's profound because people don't do this. Right. They just spend their time being critical about something. They have this overt need to beat themselves up when they're down. Yeah, uh, even when I've worked me. with... <laughs> When I've, even when I've worked with gamblers, you know, people have lost millions and millions of dollars, you know, in Vegas or wherever it is they, they go. I talk to them about this, and it's not about the money, although it seems like, yeah, it would be. No, the bottom line here is the self-loathing. Hmm. They're doing it more. The reason why they keep putting more on the table, even though they're throwing good money after bad, as the saying goes, it's more so they can hate themselves. Whoa. It's not about the loss. Yeah. They have to have a reason to be angry with themselves. So they continue to do the same thing over and over again, even when they've got enough money and they know that they could just like put all of this and just bet a little bit, you know, I could put the big money away. No, nope, I've got to put it all back up on the table. Right. And they keep doing it. Sometimes they, they have, you know, overwhelming winnings enough so that they really do, wouldn't even have to worry about it anymore. Right. Uh, made up for all their losses, and they still keep putting the same amount up. Why do they do that? It's so they can hate themselves. Wow. It's like that, that consciousness behind it isn't about the money. Yeah. And when I work with them, and we talk about this thing, it, it was interesting for me because I wasn't you know, dealing with gamblers all the time. But uh, one in particular that I was working with who had lost millions and millions, uh, I was asking him about it. And as we were dissecting this you know, through the biofeedback process, it all came down to approval. Huh. And that was something that he didn't have, and he wanted to continue disapproving of himself. And no matter how much money he made, he was going to go back and he was going to do this so that he could still have the disapproval that he needed to nurture that had to do with something that's pretty far reaching probably for, for our purposes here. Yeah. But it had something to do with his dad and his dad not approving of him. And it was almost an effort to make his dad right. Hmm. His, if his dad disapproved of him, then he was like going about life in a, in a, in a manner that was going to, to literally make his life so unacceptable that even he would disapprove of it Interesting. and he just kept doing it yeah. over and over and until he didn't have anything left you know right. that kind of thing but in his business which will remain unnamed but it actually was golf related uh in his business he could keep making money yeah. right so you know it was like well he made it all and you know he'd take care of a few necessities and then he just put it all up again wow <laughs> and that's where he got his disapproval on the golf course he was actually doing quite well yeah but the need for the disapproval would override everything else and i know i'm getting deep here folks but that's it, why it, i had it, you on the show yeah it, it, it can get quite interesting yeah, how far reaching that is but even the surfacey things, like I said, I deal with a lot of the stuff that goes very, very deep. But on, the, on a surface level, even to control the day-to-day, -day, it's just about recognizing the truth about negative emotions. Yeah. They're no different. Honestly, they're no different than this little yeah. you know, bottle of water. Right. They don't belong to us. That's the bottom line. Well, and that's why I wanted you on the show. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, candidly, um, and I said this on the show with Mickey on the Holistic Approach for Golfers video, mm -hmm where my, all my friends know, the ones that golf with me um, on a daily basis, know that my biggest weakness is my mental game, which mm. is why you've helped me with that. And you know, this is three years ago, I used to beat myself up a lot when I started in 2019. And, and now present day, like I, I'm having way more fun with it. Mm. My scores reflect that. Mm -hmm. um, even if I don't break 80, I would argue that I still have more fun than I did in 2019 when I was just taking it too serious. Mm -hmm. I mean, like you said, it's like at the end of the day, we're out there recreationally, not making money, you might have a little side bet, who cares, it's like a dollar a hole or whatever. Mm -hmm. You're just there to have fun, and, and when we destroy ourselves, and the scores reflect it. You mm -hmm. know, you could have shot an 80, but you shot an 86 because you were just mentally destroying yourself on mm -hmm. every shot of every hole, but really, golf is such a long round, 18 holes, mm -hmm. well over 72 shots, takes a long time to mess up, right? <laughs> but we do one bad That's shot, it. 
and then the yeah. rest of the round could be blown. And it's like, right. no, 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 no. That one shot is nothing. You see the pros do it all the time on TV. Exactly. You know, and they, that one shot, they're going to make up with a, a birdie or an eagle on the next hole, mm -hmm. right? And, it's, and then that, that bad shot is completely forgotten about. Yeah. So. It's kind of like pushing a, a reset button. Yeah. You know, if you, could, if you had a reset button, and you do, by the way, you do, you have a reset button in your brain that says, could I let this go? Mm -hmm. That's your reset. Just the possibility that I could let this go is everything. That, that already has established a different program. Mm -hmm. It's a different set of if, then, or kind of statements in, in our consciousness that gives us the possibility, is it possible for me to change this? Mm -hmm. Of course it is. Yes, we have that ability. Are we going to use it? Well, most of the time, most people don't know that. Right. I mean, they, they're so used to hanging on to their anger or their resentment or their guilt or whatever it happens to be. They're so used to it. It's so close to them, so familiar that they're, it's like an old friend. Like yeah. I said, it's like a, 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 an old friend that you really would like to move on from and you're just hanging on to them, you know, because you haven't replaced them with somebody else right. or whatever it happens to be. But yeah, it's not serving you anymore. It doesn't make any sense to, to have that continue. And it's the little things, the little tiny things that you think are so insignificant that can make all the difference. The biggest one for me, Corey, was when you told me after our therapy session, when I couldn't break 80 after failing that PGA test, was um, laughing at myself. Mm. I, I remember the course I played at, the day I played, uh, the friend I was playing with, I remember hitting a bad shot and I laughed. And he looked at me, he was like, what was so funny? You just hit the ball out of bounds. I was like, I'm trying something new. And, and he was <laughs> like, okay. He's weird. like, you weirdo. Like, sure, whatever that means, right? And yeah, I mean, that was that was the round. I shot, like, I think it was a 76. And, and um, that one that one out of bounds shot, double bogey, was made up for in the other holes because I laughed at myself. Mm. I said something like, oh, that's not like me. Mm. You know, instead of like, oh, I suck. That was terrible. Like, all these negative thoughts. It was mm -hmm. like, smile, laugh, a positive affirmation, um, that next recovery shot I put on the green and, and, and you know, made the putt and all that. And it's just like, it, it was fascinating after our session, what that one hour session with you, how it translated to that 18 uh, holes of golf, mm -hmm. considering the five previous rounds, I couldn't break 80. And then that one round after our session together, it was like, boom, I'm back. Yeah. And it was just, it was incredible. And it was the little things. It wasn't like I changed my swing. Mm -hmm. I didn't change my game. Mm -hmm. I literally just changed this mindset and that wow. was it. Yeah. And it was, it was a totally different story, totally different player. I had more fun, which was ultimately, I think what stopped happening was I was taking it too serious. Mm -hmm. Like I was trying to play on the tour or something, which is not even close yeah. to the case. You know? And look at all the positive things that have ensued this whole program. Exactly. What you're doing here yeah. with Linksman is I mean, this is amazing. Thank you. I appreciate this, it. I'm like, you're a big result of it. Wow. And why I wanted you on the show. I yeah. am in awe of Thank how you. amazing this place yeah, really is. Yeah, it came is. out really good. And I've been really enjoying uh, having guests like yourself on the show for it as well. You know, I mean, awesome. none of this would have happened if it wasn't for you and a few other people in my life, like like Jamie, mm. where we, uh, we, we met you and had a bunch of great sessions and you know something I never even knew existed with everything we're talking about oh, feedback and subconscious all of that and it's been it's been when, great. you know and, and of all the sports that are out there I know that everybody's you know always pointing to their head you know when yeah. you know whether it's football or tennis or you know soccer or whatever uh, of the sports that there are that really involve so much mental discipline, this one has got to be high, high, high on the list. It's, I think it's the highest. Yeah. It's not even a question. It's, it, it is so much how you're treating yourself. Yeah. How are you looking at yourself? What are you doing with this game? Right. You know, it involves so much discipline. There's no question. There's so much skill involved right. in it. But uh, there's no point in beating yourself up about it. You know, it's getting to a place where you know, when the negative emotions come up, and they will, I guarantee you, whoever's mm -hmm. watching this, I don't care whether you're a pro golfer or not, the bottom line is there will be those times when you'll have, you know, a bad shot. It's going to happen. Yeah. But what are you doing with that? If you let yourself linger with the negative emotion and, you're, you know, it, it, for instance, this is how negative it can be. If I'm holding this negative emotion, I want to pick up this little animal I can't do it right if this was really crucial to me moving forward 
and I'm holding on to this, I'm not going to do this well. Right. But if I let go of this, I can get hold of what it is I need to do. Yeah. If we look at it from that perspective, then it makes all the sense in the world to let this go. Yeah. Our mind has to wrap around that consciousness of holding on to this isn't going to let me move forward. Right. I need to be able to let this go. So how do I do it? Very simple. Question number one, could I let it go? The reality is, of course I can let it go. Yeah. It wasn't there before I hit the bad shot. I was looking forward to playing a good game of golf. Exactly. You know, all of a sudden I did that. Now what? I grab yep. and you're my negative that the rest of the 18 holes. Yep. <laughs> it's going to be hard to hit a good shot with yeah. this thing in my hand. So true. So then secondarily, would I let it go? When we have this judgment, again, I can't stress that enough. That old judgment's coming from someplace else. Mm -hmm. And I, I like to think of it as, sometimes I'll use this illustration with people, that a negative emotion is like... A, uh, a letter from the IRS or something like that, you know, and everybody looks at that and goes, oh my gosh, you know, yeah. and then they look, they, they open it up and they're looking at, you know, maybe this, you owe this much in back taxes or something like that. And they're thinking, oh no, you know, and then they look at the address again, they find out it's for somebody else. <laughs> this isn't mine. Thank oh God. good. You know, all of a sudden they've gone from all this negative emotion to right. this feeling of elation. Well, the negative emotion is very similar. It's like, it's like stamping a letter that, that came to you that you know, has all this negative stuff associated with it. And you say, return to sender. Yeah. This doesn't belong to me. It's that simple. It seems, again, it, it, you know, it seems almost ridiculously simple. But these little things will make all the difference in how you reprogram your consciousness. Yeah. It's awesome how simple it can be. Agreed. If we continue to do those kinds of processes, they become our behaviors. They become our characteristics, so to speak. Yeah. We become like one of the most positive guys out there, you know, just like fun to be around because this guy just plays golf. He's having a ball. Everybody yeah. around him is enjoying and, you know, and they're having a good time. Everybody plays better when they're around somebody who plays well. Exactly. You don't want the guy throwing clubs, negative cursing. Like I've played with those guys, and guess what? Your energy is going to feel on mine, and now I'm going to have a bad round because of your crappy attitude. Yeah. It's yeah. so true. And, and back to your point on, on how hard golf is mentally, I find it funny that even in the, in the, in the PGA tournament, the full swing documentary on, net, on uh, Netflix, I don't mm. know if you saw it, there's a break point one as well for tennis. Mm. The full swing one it's rare people talk about the mental side of golf. I don't know why, but you see the top, you know, 150 golfers in the world and they're all over the place, right? Someone will be top 10 and then they'll drop and mm -hmm. their, their name's never on the top 10 again for the rest mm -hmm. of their career. Yeah. And I personally think it's, it's the mental side. Mm. These guys' swings are great. I don't think yeah. it's really the swing. I think it's the mental game. And mm -hmm. I don't think enough people are talking about specifically for golf on how to fix the mental side of the game to fix your golf game. Mm -hmm on all the stuff you're talking about, basically. Yeah. You know, and it's, it's just, I don't know, it's an untapped area, and that's kind of why we're doing this show today, and specifically talking about it, because mm -hmm. I think you can go tamper with your swing all you want, but if your mental six inches between your ears isn't fixed, your swing is irrelevant. That's right. That's absolutely true. And it, it, as you said, it's, it's not just with golf, but golf is one of those games where it, it is hugely important to have your mental game together. There's just so much that, is, that involves technique and ability and all of that. But when you look at the top players, they're all doing it. They're basically, on any given day, anybody's capable of being anybody. Yeah. So we know that that enters into the picture. Where is the fine line between the one that's consistent in all of it? Their mental game is the one that's together. Yeah. Because they know that. They're very much aware that this is what it's really all about. As far as the memory and all of the stuff is, you know, when you get, uh, you, 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 you line up your tea and all the rest of it, that stuff is going to be very fundamental. You've done it so many yeah, times. It's a routine. It's, it's right. routine, man. I know how to do this. Yeah. Where is the nuance here? That, that, you know, I suddenly just hit a bad shot. What is that about? How did that even remotely enter into the picture when mm -hmm. I, was, I was here with a good attitude and whatever that happens to be? It's almost like a, a personal challenge. It's almost like the gambler who keeps putting it all up there again, yeah. only so that he can, you know, hate himself afterwards. 
when we make those kinds of, let's say, uh, adjustments to whatever is going on in our, our life experience, it could be just something that, you know, you got a bad cup of coffee at Starbucks or something. Nothing wrong with Starbucks. But, but whatever it is, you know, you just happen to pick up something that maybe it was a driver on the road that just kind of upset you before you got to the golf course or yeah. something like that. Those little tiny things can enter into the picture. Get yourself clear. Yeah. You know, look at it from the standpoint of, man, isn't it awesome that I actually have the opportunity? I have the, the health, the, the, health yeah. the well-being, the opportunity to be able to get out here in this magnificent golf course, yeah. wherever it happens to be. And, you know, the, the ones out here are just amazing. Uh, isn't it a joy just to be able to do this? Yeah. When we start with that kind of, again, this gets into other areas like gratitude and you know, the positive thinking part of it, but really that's what it is. Yeah. If we're operating from that kind of consciousness, everything flows. We're not really worried so much about all of the other stuff. Yeah. It, we wind up operating out of that consciousness of, of, isn't it great that I even have an opportunity to do this? We get down to the core basics there, yeah. and man, everybody starts thinking, "Well, yeah, you know, yeah, I, I guess I'm being very ungrateful about the life that I've been experiencing. You know, that I, you know, I live in this amazing country. I have all of these opportunities. You know, it it almost sounds like, oh, well, you know, start playing the national anthem chorus, yeah. getting up on a, a bandstand here. <laughs> but it's true, you yeah. know, if we get to the the core basics of, of how privileged we are just to be able to walk out there onto a golf course, whether you're going to play a great round or not. I mean, just the fact that you have the opportunity to be there. Yeah. Start with that. Yep. And you've got nowhere to go but you know, feeling optimistic and, and happy and, and very present. Yeah, it's say. true. I mean, to your point, I would bring my personal life to the golf course. Like, let's say, hypothetically, I was in a fight with Jamie, mm -hmm. and I would go to the golf course with that fight in my mind. You can guarantee I'm going to shoot at least five strokes worse because that now is mm -hmm. in my mind when it really shouldn't be. I should be clear and enjoy the day. Or I've had situations where I'd be working while golfing. Yeah. You know, I hit a decent shot, you go to your phone, you, you send an email, and you're like, oh, I gotta shoot, I gotta, hit, I gotta hit my next shot. And then that next shot is just like out of bounds, sprayed right, and you're like, where is my mind right now? Well, guess what? Your mind is in that email that you just sent, or mm -hmm. in that relationship fight that you had dealt with. So like, what mm -hmm. your personal life is going to translate to the round of golf or mm -hmm. tennis? I mean, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter golf. It's any sport, really, for this mm -hmm. matter. And I've, I've definitely noticed that where mm -hmm. the personal life or whatever emotions are going through, what's helped me and maybe what would help other viewers on the course, I've found myself, I think I read a book uh, that said this, is to look up at the sky, close mm -hmm. your eyes, listen, you know, use your other, your other um, sensory perception. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Your other senses. And I found that after a bad shot, I would, I would just straight up look at the clouds, watch the clouds blow, or if it's a sunny day, just kind of look out at the skyline, listen to the birds in the, in the trees. And then all of a sudden, you're just, you almost like hip, hip, hypnotize yourself in a way. Mm -hmm. It's very little, obviously, but you, you get into this weird state of mind. You're like, okay, I'm chill again. And then you go up and hit that shot after breathing a couple times. You're like, boom, I'm back, mm -hmm. you know, just like that. Yeah. It's interesting. It can be that simple. And what you're talking about is, is a, a process, again, I use a lot when, when I'm doing teaching meditation, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, I always ask people to be present. In other words, you know, there's, there's an awareness here, whoever's watching this and, you know, as we're, we're engaging in conversation. Clearly, you're here. You're in the moment. Mm -hmm. You were having this conversation. So you're present. You're, you're actually... Um, here in the moment and not outside somewhere or washing your car or doing something else. You're very present in this moment. You know we're having this conversation. That's one part of our, our consciousness. The other part that's quite interesting is that there's an awareness behind that mm -hmm. that knows that you're having this conversation. Yeah. Now, when we are operating out of that consciousness, and it kind of, this kind of gets very like Zen-ish, but it's, it's awesome. I, like I said, I teach meditation all the time to yeah. people. It, once we're present and aware, the natural by byproduct of that is optimism. You can't help but feel good about yourself. It's a necessary outcome of the, all of that. It's just being present, hmm. being aware, the natural flow is optimism. 
when we're not present, that means we're somewhere else. Yep. And usually when we're somewhere else, what are we doing? We're looking at something that might have happened on the way to work or an argument or something like that. We're not being present. Yeah. And then, you know, the, the awareness of that, again, works against us as well, because then the awareness part of it is saying, well, where are you? What are exactly. you doing? You know, there's, you know wh what are you doing over there? There's all this judgment that goes with it. So when we're moving in the direction of just being present in this moment, right now, right here, right now, there, we have everything we need to be happy. Everything is right here. It's okay. Got enough air. You got enough food in your body. Yeah. There's nothing missing, right? Can I be okay with that? Yeah. From there, there's this awareness that, oh, this, that's true. I'm very present. I'm very much aware. And in that awareness, there is a natural tendency. It, it leans naturally toward optimism. It's like standing and sitting. Yeah. You know, if we eliminate laying down, let's just say there's two options here, standing or sitting. You're one or the other, but you can't be both. If you're leaning toward optimism, you automatically, or let's say you let go of negativity, mm -hmm. you automatically lean toward optimism. Right. That's one or the other. So what are we doing? It actually takes a lot of effort to move in the direction of negativity, yeah. much more so than it does optimism. That kind of comes very effortlessly. So then this is why a lot of my processes have to do with letting go. Because the negative emotion isn't a part of us. It really isn't. Yeah. All we have to do is let go of that. And our natural tendency will be to laugh. It'll actually be to move forward with optimism, with some clarity, with mm -hmm. some confidence. That's what is a natural byproduct of it. It's a, a lot of what I teach just has to do with being your natural self. When we see children, for instance, anybody out there has had children, or you know, you, we've all been children, but we've forgotten the optimism of children, what it took to learn how to walk. Yeah. That kind of trial and error that goes on in a little child that doesn't, you know, we can't explain to them, these are the quadricep muscles right. you need to Way use. too technical. They don't know anything yeah. about that. They just see grown-ups walking around yeah. and they want to do it. So they lean up against a piece of furniture or whatever it is and yeah. they just keep trying. There's a lot of pain that's involved in that because their muscles are having to learn how to straighten their feet out and how to get their legs to work and support the upper torso. All of that is actually happening and they get halfway up and they fall down, they start laughing, they get back, right back up. Yeah. What is it? It's that optimism. They just have endless optimism. That's how we all learned how to walk. One of my teachers used to say this to us and I thought it was so insightful. He said, you know, if we had to learn how to walk, when we're 30 years old, we'd all be crawling. <laughs> it's true. Like he said, that. by the time we're yeah. in our mid to late 20s, we've had so much negativity happen to us that we have lost that, that natural optimism that we had as, as infants. Yeah. So if people are, you know, when I see people sometimes, they say, I just can't get rid of my negativity. I don't know how to trust people and all that stuff. And I, t I tell them, hey, Trust is normal and natural for you. Right. Because to walk, you have to trust that your legs are going to follow your upper torso. Right. And that's a real difficult thing to learn. One of the things that I used to do when I was you know, playing these, these games with people when I was in high school, is I'd get like a, you know, a football player or somebody that was a really big guy. Mm -hmm. you know, and I would tell them, you know what, I, I bet I can hold you in that chair with my finger. And it's, are you kidding me? You know, there's no, you know small guy like you, are you kidding me? Yeah. You know, there's no way I can do that. And I'd say, well, you know, I'll bet you a buck I can do that. Okay, put up the money. And all I do is put my finger on their forehead. Yeah. Now this is interesting because most people don't know this, but your forehead has to come forward in order for you to get up. Right. Now there's not a whole lot of muscles here that are doing this, but one finger, if you just hold that one finger on a yeah. person's head, they try to get up and they feel like you've paralyzed them. Whoa. They just, it's like, this isn't happening. You can't get up like this with right. your feet. You have to get up like this. Yeah. So your head has to move forward and then the rest of you moves with it. Now that's a part of learning how to walk. When children are on all fours, they don't have to have their head go forward. They can have one arm out here and yeah. one arm out here 
and they can crawl around. They can get to the edge of a carpet on a floor and they're not going to trip and fall down and you know, break a bone. Right. But when you're on two feet, you're trusting that your feet are going to follow your upper torso that's already ahead of your body, of the lower torso. You're leaning forward and your legs have to follow. You don't let your legs go forward first or you fall on your butt. You've got to lean forward and your legs yeah. will follow. So that, that process itself, again, a lot of people don't even think about what I'm talking about right now, but that involves trust. Yeah. That means we have to believe on some level that we can do whatever it is we're attempting to do. Children have that natural optimism in them. They were born with it. We've all had it. So what I'm talking about here isn't anything new. Right. It's just letting go of a belief system that says that we don't have that. That's all that it is. As we let go of the layers of the onion, so to speak, we find out what's in the center of that onion is a magnificent gem. It's yeah. a jewel. Yeah. That's great. Mm. That's a good analogy. I like that. I like mm. that. Mm. Well, this has been great, Corey. Been I, uh, I don't even know how long it's been, um, <laughs> but it feels like an hour went by uh, pretty quick per usual. Um, mm. But maybe to wrap it up, is mm. there anything else that with all of your experience and everything you've, all the patients you've seen, mm. maybe specifically to golfers that you would leave, maybe we haven't talked about, um, that you'd want to talk about, you know, before we... The only thing I can think of that is that I think is significant with any mental game, and of course, as we talked about it already, golf is that. I mean, yeah. it, you know, it, yes, it involves an enormous amount of skill, and anybody that takes it up, have some patience with yourself yeah. because it's going to be a real, real it's learning a roller coaster. adventure. Yeah, yep. but the the most important part of it is the is the mental game, and the 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 part of it that I'm talking about here has to everything to do with that. Yeah. When we're experiencing anything negative, and you know that's going to happen, yeah. that's the, the bottom line, with the best pros there are, there's going to be a shot that's going to mess with you. The idea behind it is what we were talking about. Could I let that negative emotion go? It doesn't belong to you. It really yeah. doesn't. If we can get that mindset, could I let it go? Would I let it go? When? Now, yeah. now is the time, this moment. I love it. This is our opportunity. Yep, that's so good. I'm gonna be using that on my next round, by the way. <laughs> good. Well, thank you so much for being on the You're show. You're welcome. Um, how can the viewers find you? I think you mentioned in the beginning, but maybe just one more yeah, time. Yeah, it's like... Corey DeVal at Orange County Hypnosis Center. Uh, and uh, uh, you can reach me at that, you know, um, uh, or you can call me. I don't know if you give out phone numbers. Yeah, yeah, I'll now. put that on the, on the post. Yeah, 714-624-1956. Yeah. I love it. And, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm there running the show and loving it and doing Great. what I love to do. Yeah, that's fantastic. And I know you're, you're obviously in Irvine, California. Right. So are you doing online or virtual or yeah, phone? Yeah, it's or? interesting. You know, even with COVID, uh, my, my practice actually expanded. It's, it's bizarre. I have people in China and Whoa, Japan and really? Australia and uh, Italy. How'd they find you? Just through the Yeah, it, uh, just, it's been word of mouth for yeah. the most part. I don't do a whole lot of advertising. My, my whole process is, you know, if I do a good job with each individual, they talk. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Jamie sent at least 50 people to you, I at think, least, in the last three years. <laughs> at least. At least. I'd say that's, yeah. that's the low end. Yeah. 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 No kidding. <laughs> but it's been awesome. That's great. Well, yeah. thank you again for being on the show. My I really pleasure. appreciate it. My pleasure. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you. Sir.